Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Friday ASSC session. Oh, Friday. Fe February ASSC. I wish it was Friday, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to um, our session this month. I'm Cynthia Mayer and I'm the chair for the ASSC committee and we also have um, our other members here, Tanisha um, Watkins, she's the secretary, um, and also uh, Josie, had an, uh, Josie, she's a member at large, she had an emergency so she could not be here today. And then Nora, um, I'm, I'm expecting Nora uh, to attend as well. Um, I'm not for sure where, but she's delayed. Um, and we also have Marissa Henderson. She's the co-chair of the committee this year as well. So I just want to welcome everybody. Um, everyone should have a hand, their handouts, which include the agenda, the white paper, preparing for an excellent review, a pink paper, things worth knowing, and then your yellow evaluation sheet, which our expectation is for you to fill that out after the session. Everyone should have got a um, uh, index, card. index card. Thank you. A index card. So please fill out a question and um, pass that to one of our members here. We can take your questions as we go. I want to introduce um, Matthew Piszczek, <laughs> he's going to speak with us briefly on the survey. He's from the Mike Illich School of Business, the associate professor? Assistant. Assistant professor about a survey that we want you to, to, to fill out. So thanks for giving me a couple minutes. Um, I'm Matt Piszczek. I uh, am an assistant professor in the Management and Information Systems Department in the Business School. Uh, one of my main research interests is work-life balance and how organizational policies can... Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested in work-life policies and how organizations can help employees better manage their work with their non-work lives. So uh, in cooperation with the AAUP, we're running a survey on commuting uh, specifically and how that affects your work-life balance. So you should have received an email from me yesterday inviting you to participate in the survey. The survey is entirely online. Um, it's a bit of a longer survey because it's there's variation in your commute every day, right? So we want to be able to capture that on a daily basis. So we're asking you to uh, participate in a few surveys uh, twice a day, once after your morning commute, once after your evening commute. They're very short surveys but there are 12 of them. So uh, to incentivize your participation, everyone that completes all the surveys is going to get a $50 Amazon gift card emailed to them after the surveys are done. Um, so if you are interested in helping support research at Wayne State on work-life balance and uh, helping the union learn a little bit more about the uh, work-life issues of academic staff, I hope that you'll go back and look at that email from yesterday and consider participating in the survey. We have enough uh, funding from, the, from Labor at Wayne to support about 120 participants. So far we've had about 70 sign up, so there's still plenty of spots left. Um, if you do want to participate, I please just ask that you fill out the first survey by Sunday. We're going to start running the daily surveys Monday, and it's five days. So um, it should take less than an hour total to do all the surveys. Uh, and uh, you will get your $50 gift card at the end. Uh, so thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me those questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now what we, I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists today. We're so, we're so happy to have them with us today. We have Ricardo Villarosa, um, and he is... Academic, Academic advisor for four. Okay, good. Thank you. And then Dr. Boris Baltes, uh, Associate Provost <coughs> for Faculty Affairs with us today. So they're going to talk to us <coughs> excuse me, about uh, select salary and annual review. And 
we're going to start with an overview. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. So it's really, I'm used to standing up when I do this, so this is going to be awkward. Quick, just to give us a sense of who's in the room. How many people here have ESS or tenure? Tenure group. And now, a little bit louder. How many people have ESS or tenure? Show of hands so I can see who's in them. All right. On the other end of the spectrum, who's been here three years or less? So a big group. Okay, so we got a nice mix. All right. That's not. We're not going to dice it all down to everybody. Um, so Mark, you're in the back, or Sarah. If my voice dips, lay a hand up, and I'll, I'll bring the volume back up. <laughs> We are going to talk about, the, the title is um, Selective Salary and Annual Review. Um, we're going to talk almost exclusively, the big part about this will be about Selective Salary, because that's, that's a cycle that everybody falls into. Annual Review applies to those who, are, um, who don't have ESS or tenure. There are great handouts. We'll refer to them a little bit and really to where they're, where they're distinct. But the thrust of our question and answer session um, is going to be based on selective salary. Um, but you can also refer to these and then catch up with your mentors or the other groups if you have specific questions about annual review. But so that, I'll just say that this. Annual review is separate from selective salary contractually in terms of the areas and the requirements, but it is oftentimes put together. And so that's probably the, the biggest takeaway for today is recognize that if you don't have ESS or tenure, you should be getting an annual review every year. And it is incumbent upon you to find that out. If you're in a bigger place that has a committee and that structure, that's probably going to happen without you necessarily having to be pursuing it. But if you're in a smaller unit or you don't have a department committee where you work, reach out. Reach out to a mentor, reach out to somebody, because it is your responsibility as well. I mean, the administration does it, but at the end of the day, if you don't get it, you should be asking for it uh, because it benefits you for renewals, for applying for ESS, promotions, selectives, all these pieces. You want to make sure that you're, you're setting that timeline up. And that timeline tracks typically with your individual hire date, which may be outside of a, a promotion clock or a selective salary clock, which is also why sometimes it gets left behind. Um, it should also not be the same document. The processes, the materials just being put together are very similar. Your professional record goes in and is used for both of those. And I know we have other workshops, um, both ASSC and the, 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 the longer deeper dive workshops that you should be attending if you have not to help you with your professional records. But they're, they are separate. They should be, should be kept separate. So, Ricardo, could you just explain what annual review is and what select salary is? Yeah, annual review is the, the review that comes up annually for, <laughs> for, for those members who don't have ESS. If you have, if you don't have, if there's not an ESS a personnel committee in your unit, if there is a personnel committee, they conduct it. It's a peer review process. In the absence of a committee, it's going to be your direct supervisor who conducts that review. The components are actually listed, the minimum requirements for it are listed in the contract. Um, and I believe they're excerpted. They're not in there. Yes, the criteria used are pulled from the contract in the middle of this pink sheet, so I'm not going to go over them all here. It is not a numerical base. Selective salary is numerical. We'll talk about that in scoring. So one of the things that this is not, and sometimes um, for non-faculty, personnel, so academic staff, obviously, and other non-teaching uh, personnel in a department, uh, a uh, p and staff or staff association, their reviews often have a numerical component. And so you want to make sure that you're not getting a, an annual review from a supervisor that is somehow scoring you. It should be a narrative and following the guidelines that are listed in the contract there. Um, again, there's going to be some variation on how that happens. And if you are in a unit that is big enough to have a committee, that will happen. Marianka, you have a question. You kept mentioning that if you have a committee, it can be handled by the committee. In our college, liberal arts and sciences, we do have a committee elected by academic staff, chaired by associate you have a, You have the college level. College level. But you don't have um, But I don't know that <coughs> if you're 
a lot of bigger departments in class, and we might, but most departments in class that don't have a departmental committee, mm -hmm. you're going to have to tell your department chair, because I didn't get one until I told my department chair. It's been a long time, but a lot of department chairs don't realize that that's something they need to do. So your direct supervisor needs to be, if you don't get one around your anniversary date every year until you apply for ESS, you need to remind them that you need that. The purpose of that, which I'm sure they'll explain, is so that you're not blindsided in your fourth or fifth year. You're not going to get ESS because. So that whole time, the way you're working up towards to apply for ESS, you should know where you stand in terms of your performance. Um, of course, yeah. Well, I was just going to echo that because the... The chairs uh, turn over, and they don't always. Uh, I was in that same situation as chair of psychology, um, and we're trying to work on chair training uh, to make sure they know some of the responsibilities they have, and some do. So I don't want to say, but uh, I, I just want to echo that. Yeah, you want to reach out because they may not be aware, especially if they're new, um, that they need to do that. So. so um, I want to shift for a moment to selective salary. And from the, there's two documents on the provost site that are the provost guidelines and the annual memo that comes out uh, for selective salary. Those are distributed from the provost office, but they're done in consultation with the union because it, that has to, it conforms to the contract, but it reaches the gaps that, that the contract language doesn't provide for. And so over years, this, this has evolved. Um, but it says here, the purpose of selective salary review process is twofold. It's a peer review process to identify and reward excellence in categories of job performance, professional achievement, and service. Scholarly achievement and equity will also be considered when appropriate. And we'll talk about what those are as we go through. Um, the process is also means to provide support and mentoring with long-term job performance of tenured academic staff and academic staff with ESS is substantially below disciplinary norms in unit <coughs> um, So that's the, the, the broadest scope. What we'd like to do, um, we've got a series of questions that members of the uh, academic staff steering committee have, and we're going to do this in a, in a little bit more of a question and answer format. Uh, general guidelines, though, need to be read as you're putting things together. Um, and we should, thank you, Mark, and we should address, if there's, again, that's why we passed out questions. So we've got some questions that have already been fed to us, and hopefully by the end of the session, you should have the questions answered that you have individually. Um, there is variation, as you'll see. So often the question that you have will be, it depends, and we'll try to put a, a framework on that for you. Um, but it's not a process that lends itself because it's not a cookie cutter process. There's the contract, there's guidelines, but there's a lot of variation as you see as we work through the questions. So, um, did everybody get a card that wanted to fill one out? And we can also take, you're also welcome to raise your hand to it as we do through the moderators. Okay. Um, one of the first questions from the. Okay. Um, one of the first questions. Okay, so what happens if you don't do annual review or a um, so if you do not turn in your annual review, well, sorry, well, let's start with selective salary. Yeah, selective salary. So if you don't turn in your selective salary, um, you, you obviously you, you won't have the opportunity to get any of the merit-based part of it, right? You will, uh, all you will be getting is the across the board, across the board, sorry. Um, and I believe that if you don't turn in for two years in a row, three out of five years. So three we have three, three, three years. Okay. Yeah. 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 If you don't turn it in for three out of five years, then oh, you no, it's, no, you're right. It's is it two? It's two in a five-year period. Two in a five-year period. So if you, sorry, if you don't turn it in for two years out of a five-year period, um, you would also then uh, forfeit your across the board yeah. as well. So you definitely want to turn it in the selective salary uh, portion in. Uh, yeah, there was a time when uh, it's been mandatory. There was a time when people think, oh, I, I just don't want to put it in because I don't think that the salary amount is sufficient. Because it's in the current contract, it's, there's the, the pools. You've heard us in the pools. So we take everybody who's in your, your unit. So if it's in your college or if you're in the, in the division, all of the salaries 
are put into a pool. That pool is split up contractually, and this is one of the things that is explicit in the contract, that in the sevens for academic staff. Four sevens for job performance, two sevens for professional achievement, one seventh for service. Within the job performance, those of you who have um, exercised the optional scholarship, if you're, if you're engaged in scholarly work and you put in something for scholarship, that actually falls within the, the four sevens for job performance. But the, the big three are the four sevens, two sevens, one seventh. That's split up into these pools, and then within the college division, that's where there's some the variation. So within that, the, the committees will that get together at the top level, the unit level, whether it's the college in class or engineering, or the division of student affairs, or the division of enrollment management, or the libraries and archives. They get together, and it's a process that's done every year. Sometimes it doesn't change over time, but it's that's where how that four sevens is distributed. Just you just get dollars. Uh, for your selective salary award, if you get a one, the, the, the highest level, some places will get about half of an award if it's 1.5. That's where some of the variation that we've talked about comes in. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't submit, if you don't submit, you not only forego that the one. The other side is the 1.25, so is split up for the selective salary. Across the board is automatic, just for being here. Selective salary 1.25 is, is split up. You forgo that if you don't submit it, but it's a contractual requirement agreed upon by the university and the, uh, the union. So if you don't submit it within for two times within a five-year period, then you're you're going to give up not just the across the uh, you're not going to give up just the uh, the merit, but across the board. And for faculty, I believe, isn't it also um, travel? Some, yes. some places yeah, there's I think they give up travel grants. You will, yeah, you won't be eligible for travel. Yeah, so I want to understand correctly. The contract says our merit, if we receive the highest score, is supposed to be 1.25. No. The contract, no. The pool is 1.25. It provides guidance, so what they can't, so the overall pool is 1.25. It has to be within the college split up. So everybody who gets, all the people who get money under job performance, that total has to equal four sevenths of the entire pool. But it does not mean that there's two different questions there. One is, if I get a one, am I going to get, if I get ones across the board, should my salary increase under the selective salary side is 1.25? The answer is no for two different reasons. The first reason is because it's an average, that 1.25 is an average of everybody. So if, you're, if you take everybody in your unit, there's 10 of us in the unit, there's a median of salaries. Is that the same for Yes, above, above the self, okay, the question. Above that, if you're below, then you could end up with more than 1.25 of your salary because the pool is bigger. It's made up of heavier weighted salaries. Mm -hmm. If you're above, if you're somebody who's more senior and you, your salary is above the median, then even if you get all ones, you're likely to get less. There's, that's one, one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that selective salary, even though we have the committees and the structure we're talking about and there's the scoring, contractually at the end of the day, that is advisory to the president and the president's designees in terms of where the money goes. It's also a part that we, it, it, it comes up. So, and Charlie has said this before, the idea that theoretically your dean could give all the money to you in job performance. And they would have, he would have to explain that to the members, but not contractually have any issue. So, was that? Yeah. So basically, we're getting a one point something raise a year. Well, you get across the board. The across the board is tied. That's what I'm talking about. One point two five. Well, no, because that's not true. If you get if you get any selective, I mean, the, you're, that's only true you if you don't two. get any selective. Correct. Your question was, if I get selective, does that mean I get for if I get all ones, do I get something? Um, Denise. Yeah, um, the unit committees, at, on this pink sheet, it says the appropriate dean, vice president, or designee chairs without vote. But then on this white sheet, I'm looking at the committee director review with a vote. There's two different things. One is annual review, and e well, e there's ESS consideration annual review. So some, in our contract, Administrators who sit on committees sometimes serve with votes, sometimes serve without votes. For selective salary, the, the administration 
person who's sitting with the committee, whether it's at the secondary, that department level, or at the college unit level, chairs would vote. And with one vote. Yeah. And so you're saying that with the vote, which one is not without the vote? The dean? It's, it's in that very small print that I can't read from here, but yeah, it's, 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 it's very explicit. That's one of the things that's very explicit in the contract. So it's not, it's not up for debate. The, your dean or your department head will have a vote? Yes. Okay. Academic staff members. But, but then, you're, then this talks about the unit committee where the dean or director does not have a vote. So are you saying that this is only for annual reviews and not selective salary? Or yeah, annual review, and selective, annual review and selective salary are two different things. You know. tell, us who, tell us if the administrator has a vote or not is what I'm trying to... So, or is trying to... Give me a specific question for one committee and ask how I'll tell you what it is. Okay. For selected salary, review. There, if your department has a, a committee that's voted on, yes. does the dean or their designee department head have a vote? Whoever the administrator selected is sitting salary. on, whoever the administrator at that committee chairs the committee with vote. I'm not sure what you're looking at, but we can look at it offline. Yeah, for, for selective salary, and you can correct me if I'm, but for selective salary, they, they do sit on there with a vote for annual, well, probably more for an ESS decision, same for faculty, would be a tenure or promotion decision. They stay, they're they part of the committee, but they don't vote on it. They have their own separate, so like when, when things come up, you have, you have the committee, right, makes their decision and votes on it. Again, like for ESS, it would be. And then also the uh, whoever the unit administrator is would get their own vote, if you will, separate. Yes. It's not part of the committee vote. Yeah. So this peak sheet applies to the <coughs> annual, um, review. annual review for yeah. students or employees that don't have ESS. Right. Yeah. Okay, guys, we want to be mindful of the or respectful of those that did write the questions down. So we're going to go ahead and fill some. <coughs> um, one of the primary things a new hire. Um, should be aware of during this process. Ah, good question. So, we've kind of touched on this already. If you're a new hire, find out who, where you are situated. The things that we've been talking about, are you in a place that has committees um, for things like promotion, for selective salary, for annual review? That's something that if you have not already been doing, go back this afternoon and say, okay, find out somebody who's also an academic staff member. Say, what, do, what are the, which of these committees do we have what is the process for me? Um, I think that's the, the big initial piece, is to take that out. And then, start to figure out which timelines apply to you. Again, because some of the timelines in these processes um, are based on when you were hired. Were you hired in May? Were you hired in August? Were you hired in January? For things like annual review and ESS, there's an ESS clock and an annual a renewal clock but that doesn't mean that your annual review will automatically be tied to it. So again, we're going, it have, these are, this doesn't lend itself to a, if you're this, then that kind of an answer. Other than find out where you are because there are two different clocks that maybe will apply to some of your, the things that you need to go through. Whether it's selective salary, promotion, annual review, and contract renewal, all those pieces. What are your options if you disagree with the annual <coughs> <laughs> you don't want to take it. <laughs> All right. Um, so you're uh, on the annual review. You're, so the annual review. There's again. We've kind of talked about two things. If there's the peer review process, and with that one, the committee that actually. You're, if there's if there's three or more members who are giving you a review on that committee level, then they're preparing something that your supervisor it usually has a checkbox where the, the supervisor can just concur with it, with with or without comment or can disagree and write, provide their own review. And these, again, these are going into your, the idea that these are going into your packet. And then within, you're supposed to get two weeks notice, and you sit down with, in either case, if it's just you and a supervisor, or if a, a peer committee had also provided that review for you, 
you sit down with the supervisor and go over that. If you don't agree with it, you, you have, you're sitting there with a one-on-one, -on -one, you have the opportunity to have that conversation, and ultimately, if you sign in and say, it's, it's not, I don't agree with that, that would be, that's your option. It becomes a part of your, a part of your packet going forward. Um, anything else you want to do? Ricardo, is that the same process for um, selective salary? Are you notified, and if you disagree with your scores, do you? Good question. We'll come back to that in just okay. a second. I think that, that's going to come up in our questions, so we'll, we'll take that in a, in a moment. Should selective salary cover specific expectations related to job rank? Say, <clears throat> example, ex academic staff four with leadership and mentoring. Academic staff. <clears throat> so I got the first part. I lost it. I lost on the second part. <laughs> so the, the things that you are graded on, should they relate to your specific ranking? Ah. <laughs> yes. So we've got in the in one of the documents on the provost site from the provost guidelines, there is this document that goes over those categories. Um, it has both standards of evaluation for job performance, professional achievement, service, and then scholarship, scholarly achievement if applicable. And then it also says in the ranks. So to get a one. Uh, so the, the rankings that you get on selective salary for job performance, you can get a one, two, three, or four, and there's the ability, depending on where you're at, sometimes it's just in, in whole numbers, sometimes you can have a 0.5 distinction, so you can get a 1.5 in something, or a 2.5. Um, again, for the most part, most of the units, the ex examples I know, you're only going to be in the money if you get a 1 or a 1.5. There may be some variation, but I am, I'm not aware of any place that, that gives any portion of selective salary below that. Um, now, the question, though, was about specific activities. We talked about, um, well, you've heard about another presentation of factors, so I won't go too deeply into those, but there are, know that there are, at the highest level, university factors, then often college or division factors, and sometimes department level factors. Those get they all have to be in line, but they're the broadest at the university level, college level will be a little bit less variable because it may be college specific. But we have, as we've seen, so much variation that departments may be a little smaller and then your classification. So if you're in a small unit or it may be that you're just it's your job description and the university factors that are coming together. But in terms of evaluation, the guidelines provide some guidance, but neither the factors nor the provost guidelines are either, a, they're not a rubric or a checklist. These are examples of things that you could have. So for example, in job performance, this one just talks, the provost guidelines don't talk about specific ranks or specific classifications. Your individual department factors, I'm looking at Kristen, and, and the librarians and the archivists have their factors. Um, advisors, ASOs. So if I did a quick show of hands, uh, how many people, that's, that's, I don't raise your hands, but if I said, how many people are academic advisors? Certain people raise their hands. How many people are ASOs? And if I said, how many people are directly advising students? Some of those, those same people might be raising their hands. So there's not, again, you may have locally specific guidelines. You're, that's where your factors come in to say what you'll be evaluated on. If you don't have those, it's the university factors. And you can use, if you don't have real specific factors, you can use the guidelines to help craft what you're putting into your professional record, into your narrative because that's providing guidance to the committees, at least at the college level and unit level, in terms of what they're, what they're scoring you on. This is where the conversations will be had when, when all those records are in front of us. We'll be referring to these, but they're not, be careful, they're, they're not, like, it's not a checklist. Oh, you, you, you don't have presentations. So it says here presentations, you don't have presentations, you don't get this. It's not <laughs> that cut and dry. Did that? Okay. Um, can you recommend a deadline for collecting materials and submitting um, for selective salary or professional or the um, annual review? Well, there's, there's, I mean, from your memo, I went to the highest level. Yeah, we, I mean, the, the, the back end of that. Right. Yeah. The, the provost office puts out a deadline for when um, uh, that, well, not for selective salary. But, well, yeah. there actually, there's part of it because of the, 
for selective salary, it does come out there because they've got, to, they've got to get them in for the mass salary. So if, yeah, oh, for the mass salary, right. So, there, so there's a deadline put out by us in the provost's office uh, for when the, the information needs to get to us. And then usually the units need to start, they have to back up from there and decide on what their dates are going to be. Um, and that's really left up to the, to, to the college level and, and to the departments then, right? If you have a department co committees, they would have to figure out what date they need it by so their committees can look at it so they can get up to the college level. Um, so there's no one date besides the one that has to get to us. Yeah. So, so they've got their, so there's the, and this is the other document, again, the, the evaluation and then there's the memo. And that each year comes out to all the deans and directors and chairs um, and is on the Provost website, so you can also check for yourself. It's around the same time of the year. But this one says, um, completed departmental evaluations must be forwarded to the appropriate dean or vice president no later than May 15th of 2019. So in this coming cycle, they've got to get it there. And then the college of division levels have to be in the Provost's office by June 10th. Now, this is, those, so those, are, those are the deadlines that the, at the administration level they're working with. But then that backs into... Some places, um, and again, for some of the places that have this as a bigger group, you may start this process earlier. So you want to watch and find out when are, typically for Selective Center, because it is a mass activity, <laughs> unlike when I was talking about annual review or ESS, which is more individualized in some cases, Selective Salary, for all of your faculty members that are in, in an area and all the academic staff who are eligible, will be driven more, so you're more likely to hear that timeline and be given that timeline to be able to prepare um, and submit your materials even if you are in a, in a, a smaller unit. Um, but if you know, if you're a person of one in a shop of one, make sure that you're communicating with your chair or supervisor so that they don't, you don't both get surprised. So should materials, what is included in an annual review? What do you submit for uh, an So for annual review, and this is, so in both cases you're going to submit your professional record. Um, professional record is the only thing that's required for your annual review. For selective salary, you're also required to submit that three-year report that we're um, more familiar with now. Um, sometimes it's called your, your, you know, your five greatest hits. It's the things that talk about in the areas of job performance, professional achievement, service, and scholarship, if, if applicable, what you've been doing. Um, and it's a three-year period so that if you have an off year, it's, it's, it's a smoothing process. So it, it's, 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 and if you have that, usually it's, it's updating it. So having it in a format where you're, you're updating it is, is, is fine. Now, what we found is that in some places, because these two things often happen at the same time, there are some places where a member will submit that whole piece, the, 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 the annual, the um, three-year summary, oh, which the three-year also includes what you're doing right now. What's coming up? What's on your plate that's in progress? So that's that last part of it. It's in the, in the guidelines. Your three-year activity plus what's current activities. Um, that's usually on the end of paragraph or so at the end of your three-year report. That, there's nothing wrong with sending that, or if, in some places it's expected to come to practice. That goes along with your professional record, and that's what your peer review committee may be looking at. That's what your supervisor may be looking at. Um, so there's, there's the variability in how that happens. Um, there's nothing that says it can't happen that way, and there's some arguments for that would be helpful if somebody is writing a review to be able to hear right from you beyond your record what you're what you're doing. Ricardo, just to go back to the scoring, um, yes. can we just have a little bit more information about which scores receive merit, and is there any recommended system of scoring or fractions rounding off, et cetera? Well, the <coughs> excuse me, um, the. The scoring uh, has to be at least in point fives, yeah. so you can't, you, Nothing small you can't turn in a 1.25, that can't actually get there, so you have 1, 1.52, 1. Um, and so forth. Um, and then in terms of what, uh, which scores get merit, that's, there's <laughs> nothing really contractual about which scores uh, get merit. So. From my, from what I've seen, it's always usually ones and 1.5s um, that get merits. Um, uh, but that's tech. I mean, I, I guess a unit could decide they want to do it differently. Right? Yeah, I mean that's yeah. it, the, 
some units have a very explicit conversation every year. Um, typically, the dollar amount that's available isn't calculated at that time. I know, like, for those of us who have people like Gary Morton from HR who comes and sits with these meetings, they don't have, like, what's the dollar amount this year? Some places they have that, but it's not the norm. It's usually a conceptual. Like, do we want to give only people who get a one some money? Or do we want to say that we'll give uh, $100, for example, to a one and $50 to a 1.5? That kind of, of, it's usually, what I've seen it done, it's usually half, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and this is a, a, a piece that, that, that comes up. The, I, there's a, things that we've dealt with in the last couple of years. There is oftentimes a sense that because this is a peer-driven process and there's scores and it goes up and we see the, the spreadsheets, that, that if the committee at that unit at the college level gives you a 1 in one category, 1.5 in another, that that's automatically going to translate to a certain dollar amount. And as we've seen, that's most often the case, but it is not contractually a requirement. Um, even though that's, and you, in the last few years, we've all been getting the scores. We get, and it says now, um, this came after the, the letter of agreement for some of the other units, um, that said that within five days you get your score. So you do get your score, and there's been an assumption that that score is what was at your college level committee. And in most cases, or the division level committee. In most cases, that is exactly what it is, and so nobody questions it. But the reality is, it's always been subject to a change by your dean or vice president if somebody else gets more money or less money. Again, as um, Boris said, that's not, that level of precision isn't in the contract. It's just the, the, the practices around doing this. And so the practice hasn't changed, but on this, to, to, to make it, more clear, there's a footnote on this now the, where it says, um, and again, this is the, the, the notice is more uniform now, it didn't have to be. Um, <laughs> staff must be informed of the unit salary committee evaluation and numerical ratings within five days of the committee meeting. And that's been in there for several years. Um, that was when John Vanderweek was the, in, in this role, that was put in. That was a result of the um, administration and the union negotiating for the School of Medicine and others where they had to come up to an appeal was available at the, um, at the <coughs> University P&T level. That was a part of that and then it got extended from the provost office to everybody which benefits because the practice had been not uniform in the past. Sometimes you didn't know until a fall if you got your, you got your scores. Mary, I can write it down just because we're trying to keep up with the, with the thing. Thank you. I just was going to say, class, College of Arts and Sciences, everybody knows they got their notice for last year's raise a couple weeks ago. Just to let you know, it wasn't five days, it was about a year. That's all I was going to say. So it doesn't always happen. Okay, this, this next question has multi layers to it. So, how does the committee evaluate a colleague they have little contact with? Is it allowed to ask their supervisor and or others who have more interaction with them to provide written comments to the committee? And is it appropriate or allowed for the committee to use attendance in evaluating job performance? Do you want to pick those that apart? Yeah, okay, here we go. So the first one. Let's break that up. Okay, how does the committee evaluate a colleague that they have little contact with? So, this comes up uh, a lot in, in categories like promotion also that goes up to a university level committee um, or in a division like student affairs where we've got people from several different departments. Uh, in some cases, you have representatives from the different units, so the different departments, so there's somebody that's there. Um, it's important, and it, it, that, that stresses the importance of your three-year summary because your professional record tells part of the story, but if you think, if you leave it up to those who may not work with you every day or may not know exactly, you're an ASO, you're an academic advisor, but your role is slightly different of the things that you do, we all do so many different things. Your professional record is part of that, but it really is, it's why it's necessary to spend a lot of time. I get, I sit on the, the committee I sit on, sometimes the three-year summaries, and you've all seen that anybody who's been on this up, you'll get a, a three-year summary that's just cut and paste from a professional record. That does me absolutely no good, and unless somebody's really telling me wonderful things or this professional record is just so amazing, 
it doesn't really help the person, but they're like, oh, it's just, I'm just doing this. So, whereas on the other hand, if I see somebody who I don't know what they're doing, but I can read because they've explained it to me, that helps. That's, that's how, and having, not somebody having to you, there was part of that we're saying having somebody else come in. Yeah, is it allowed to ask their supervisor and, and or others who have more interaction with them to provide written comments to the committee? Yeah, the, well, we kind of talked about yeah, this right. early, earlier, and I, I think what we were saying is that it, it, the committee could ask the supervisor to try to get some more information. The chair of the... Or the chair, yeah, sorry, the, the supervisor. The chair of the committee to get more information, but the, we weren't saying you should go out on your own and try to get more, or yeah. you should be using what's in, what's, you know, what everyone submits, right? They all submit their standardization there, and you should be using that. Yeah, the absolute, the general, in fact, in some places, it's probably the practice is absolutely nothing more than what comes in, gets, gets considered by the committees. Um, it, we've sometimes, in the big division of, of academic affairs, have had a question that's come up and said, well, we really like this, and we're not really quite sure between these two things. Is there something to clarify? But that's, I don't think that's the norm. Um, and so it should be just what's coming up. Again, the packet. Now, there's another side of that question that sometimes comes up and says, well, when the top administrator, that's the dean or the vice president, are they allowed to consider anything other than what's in that packet? This yes, because again, this whole process is an advisory. There's nothing that says that uh, somebody can't say, well, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm trying. That's all information. Just like there's, there's questions that come up sometimes. Well, my department level or my supervisor gave me these scores, gave me all ones, or gave me whatever score was in there, and then it got changed at the unit level committee, the highest level committee. Yeah, that's because the, what comes up from either your direct supervisor or from that lower level committee is, is also advisory to the, the committee at the top level. Um, so it, it, oftentimes it's consistent, but where it varies, and it has varied both in going down and going up. So we hear about it sometimes we say, oh, I had, I had a 1, and somebody gave me a 1, the committee gave me a 1.5. What you haven't necessarily heard is that, oh, my supervisor gave me a 2, and the committee thought I should be getting a 1 or 1.5. That happens too. Again, it's, it's in that peer process at that top level. Um, so, but the idea that beyond that committee process, if, if a, a supervisor, I mean, we talk as peers, administrators talk as peers, there's that, that other information is, is allowed because this whole process is advisory up to the top. Here's a good follow-up question from, from the audience to that. So what, what exactly happens when you're looking at a unit that everybody in the unit is three years or less or younger? <laughs> There's, I'm not sure which so there's no committee. So there's no committee. When there's no committee, because oh, well, so they, yeah, so they're, they're, well, this would be five years. Or, yeah. So if, if you don't have anybody, if you don't have three members with ESS and you don't have a, a committee, then it's the working with your direct supervisor serves that role, provides scores. They should be giving annual reviews that give a narrative and separately scores that then go up to the college or the department level committee. And at the unit level, the highest level, the committees have to be. Um, Half of the members have to have ESS. So it's not required, if, for example, at the college level committee. It doesn't require that everybody has ESS, but more than half, the majority have to have ESS. So you might have nothing. So some of those people, in a, if you're in a department, in a small department, one of those representatives may be serving at a college level committee, which then also is helpful because it gives them some insights and helps with the other, with the peers. So this is a question from the audience. Elaborate on mentoring requirement for selective salary process. Um, who are the mentors? Is it the elected committee or someone else? <laughs> That's my go to you. Okay. It's, um, so, selective salary is predominantly governed by Article 12 of the contract, which is the, the salary piece. It ties together with Article 24, which is around professional performance, professional development, and also includes, um, as of the, the current contract, this idea of mentoring. So we hear, as academic staff members, we hear a lot of different, the term mentoring gets used quite a bit, so that's a great question. Um, in the other presentations we've talked about mentoring, there is the, um, the mentoring committee that was supported by the provost's office, 
the um, the uh, advisor training academy provides mentors. We have a lot of different informal mentoring processes. There is a contractual mentoring referral that comes out through the selective salary process. Um, this was a result of post-tenure review debates um, back in 2012. And so it is a, it's supposed to be a process for development if you are in job performance uh, for academic staff, falling below, uh, if you get a three or a four, then the committee may recommend to the administration that you be selected, you put into a, a mentoring program. Um, in fairness, we're, for both faculty and academic staff, there are not that many occurrences. Um, we're actually meeting right now to develop something similar to the selective salary guidelines to deal with some of the issues with that. Um, the contract does outline how many people there's, I'm going to paraphrase here, uh, but there's a, a committee is selected from the member gets to pick, the administration gets to pick, and I believe the deans, well that's the, the administration. Yeah, I think it's just the, there's three members of the committee. I have to go into it. I'll go into it look, in, look for a moment. But so you have three members of the committee. It's a year-long process. Um, it, again, has not been utilized very often, um, but it, it comes from job performance being low. Okay, follow up to that. What is the standard for documentation for the committee? If they rate someone low, what sort of evidence must be in hand or provided as a rationale for that rating? You can look at that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were actually talking about this one earlier too because, uh, again, Ricardo, correct me if I'm wrong, um, there's really there's nothing really set up that there has to be a feedback process. Um, so there's nothing really uh, in the, the, the contract or the guidelines that says, okay, we have, you know, the committee has to give some kind of narrative or some kind of feedback to, the, to an individual. Um, uh, it will be encouraged. Obviously, we want people to get feedback. Um, and I think when it does happen, uh, we've talked about it, it's probably going to be that the, the person might meet with the supervisor and the supervisor would have to kind of talk about what was, what the committee talked, you know, what they discussed, what, what uh, challenges might have, they might have seen in the, in the, in the, the package. But there's no um, contractual setup that says that they have to get feedback. So, so part of the the issues that come up around this, and it also comes up with, with issues of promotion, uh, ESS, mm -hmm. and what um, John has said in the past, Vanderwee, and we, we've kind of supported the idea that there, these committees that have a chair, an administration chair, um, if you're a member who's not, if you, you're not pleased with your selective salary score, the first place you can go is to the chair. And that comes in part from members of these committees who have said, we don't want people coming up to us individually and, and, and negotiating or, or, or appealing the process because I know that somebody knows that I'm on the committee, they don't like their scores, and I'm in the corner trying to answer for a, a process. Um, and so we said, let, let, let the administration deal with, with that part. <laughs> that adds, only answers part of it um, because there's, again, there's not in the process right now, things get articulated, but there's not a note-taking process. And in some respects, that it's it's challenging. At the one end, to be developmental, you have to be able to get some qualitative data, like oh, you 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 should be doing more of X. But it may not be that you have to do five of X. So there's not as much precision. Um, and it's it, there's an, also an aspect of it that um, I think part of the reason why we've been reluctant on both sides and why it hasn't really developed into something that's more meaningful to the candidates is that both from the administration side and the union side, there's challenges doing this in a way that doesn't become, that becomes developmental for the person who didn't get what they want without being like an appeal process in that meeting to go over and debate point. If, if you, I guess there's a fear sometimes. Well, if we say that you didn't do X, you'll say, but I did Y, and Y should be just as good. And it, it, 
again, both the administration and the, the peer process, the peers who've been involved with this, it, it, it's there. We were talking about it. We'll hope to move forward somewhere, and maybe in our development of, of some guidelines around 24 that there's a, some conversation around it. But as of right now, you should ask your, so the, the takeaway is, if you're not happy with your scores, ask your, um, the, your direct supervisor or whoever chaired at that level, and you can find out. If you don't know who was at, who chaired the, the committee for class, who was in from the dean's office, you can ask your supervisor or ask the dean's office. They will provide you that information. If you're in the libraries, if, if you don't know who the administrator who sat at that top level committee was, you can find out, and they will sit down with you and tell you what they can and provide guidance, and it's a starting point. I'm going to just go back for just a moment because those of you who know me, I try not to, I, this contract is not fun to memorize. It's enough just trying to interpret it, so that's why I kind of pulled back on the earlier. But with regard to mentoring, um, this page of 115. It's great reading if you're having trouble sleeping. Um, <laughs> if in the course of regular annual review, selective salary review, re review, the salary committee, and not the administrator, it's the salary committee as well, concludes that the academic staff member has been performing at a level that is substantially, substantially below the unit's factors and norms, the salary committee may recommend to the chair, dean, chair director, dean, that a peer mentoring committee and then it says C, uh, section C, A, C4, A below, um, be established to address the issues raised by the salary committee. And then it goes on into A, B, C, and D that I'm not going to read to you, but there's a, there's a very prescribed detail. And as detailed as it is, we've seen in the last few years where there are questions that are not addressed by what seems to be a very detailed piece, and that's why the administration and the union are getting together, both in the faculty and the academic staff side, to try to fill some of those gaps in the same way that the selective salary process over many, many more years has addressed some of those things. It will never give us that certainty, but right now it only comes about this far. We want to try to see if we can move it a little farther, um, informed by some of the challenges that have popped up. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more. Can you still hear me in the back, Mark? All right. So factors are what you're being uh, graded upon, and what happens when a unit's factor differ from the provost's guidelines? Who has the priority? They should. <laughs> so they sh when they when they that question came up. So they shouldn't differ in in terms of being mutually exclusive or something that goes in two different directions. As we said in the beginning, the university factors are really broad. It's like saying you know the Constitution of the United States is only this big, but we've got all this case law. So, so but things again, that doesn't mean then that that when individual decisions are made, they have to be, they can't be inconsistent. So your unit factors can't be inconsistent with the university factors and the contract, but they may vary. So the, the idea of difference has many meanings. So they, they, they should be more specific at each level, the university level, the college or division level, and the department level, they get more and more specific, and again, maybe by year classification, um, but that specificity should not be in a way that seems to contradict or be a, inconsistent with the, the higher level ones. Like the strategic plan, for example. Very broad, it comes down, maybe more specific, but can't go in a completely different direction. I think there's a question. I don't know if you want to. Can I just yeah. ask quickly, what's the timeline for voting in salary committees or ESS committee if you have more than three ESS folks in that, your unit? That varies, there's a, that varies by unit. Very, that's very localized, so there's not a there's not a there's not a answer for that. How do we find that though? Do you know? Locally, talk to your your supervisor. Okay. I, I would just add in terms of the provo or, or in terms of the unit factors and, and the university factors. If someone sees that they think there is uh, a difference or that they, they they don't match up, please let let us know. Because we I mean that that's something that. We, we should deal with it. There really is a case where a unit factor, you know, unit factors would differ. But I agree that I think most of the time, uh, you're probably not going to see that because the university ones are, are very broad. So, I think where it comes up in conversation sometimes, though, too, is is again an overly strict interpretation by either a committee member or an administrator. This is why the, the peer review the, that those committees should be a, a really vigorous conversation. Because somebody may say that, oh, this looks like community service. I mean, this looks like a per appropriate service. There's a lot of 
discussion about what fits. And because we don't have a real check-the-box rubric, that's the price of having that flexibility. Yes, we're getting close on time. Okay. This is um, um, one of the final questions from the audience, is to, and this kind of goes back to the selective salary. Explain why frac fractional time employees receive less. Okay. Um, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a piece of a question there. And, and fractional time employees or somebody who's fractional time. So not everybody knows what fractional time is. We're, we're, if you're here as a regular appointment, that's 100%. You might be on a 80% or all the way down to 50% and still be represented. There's, um, and the way that it works is that if you are fractional time, and you're, you're part time, when your peers are reviewing you, they shouldn't say you shouldn't be eligible for a one in job performance because you're fractional time. That some, comes up sometimes where somebody says, or somebody was out on leave. They were on leave for four months, so they shouldn't be eligible for a one because it's just another type of fractional time, but they weren't there. And the way that conversation has always gone is like, no, no, it's not up for us to judge that time or say that they get less in terms of their score. However, when the spreadsheet comes out, and those dollars, so if it's $100, for example, just using it as a figure for job performance for a one, when that comes out, it may be less for, you know, it's prorated for the amount of time that they're actually on the clock. They're, they're, they're there. So leave wouldn't be affected by that, but if you're contractually 80%, those numbers get, that number gets prorated. And that's, that's the, the same across we're talking faculty or yeah. the others. I mean, you're, it is prorated by your, your, your FTD, so to speak. Okay. Wait, did we get to Keith's question? Okay. <laughs> okay, this, I guess we make this the last one. Um, so, what are equity adjustments, and what does role, and what role does the salary committee play in equity recommendations? How do equity recommendations relate? to the selective salary process? So the, uh, the selective salary committee can uh, themselves make recommendations for equity changes. Um, that still runs through the, I say it's the college would be running through the dean. Um, the dean would be requesting those from the provost office because uh, and the reason why the request has to come up to the provost office is the equity raises. Um, they can't come from the selective salary pool or any of those things. They're not supposed to. They're, uh, they, they're actually an addition to the budget that's already there. So that's where the request goes, uh, or why the request goes up to the provost office for that. And so, that's, so there's an explicit language in the contract under Article 12 that talks about that that's one of the roles of salary committees is to talk about when appropriate, equity adjustments for members. And for those of you who are maybe newer, maybe wondering what's equity, um, if you're looking at it within a department or a unit, if the salaries are somehow out of line, um, where there seems to be big disparities, that's sometimes a, a basis for equity. It's challenging because in our contract, for faculty and academic staff, we have only salary minimums. And so there's a lot of variation. In other areas in the university and other places in employment, you usually hire the idea of, of a salary band. So if you're, for example, you're in ASO 2, there's a specific tight range that you have to contractually be within if you're in ASO 3. And so what happens if you look around the university and our salaries, and they're posted on a FOIA, you can, you can see them, there's a lot of variation. And the same thing with faculty. Faculty in philosophy, chemistry, law, you might have all assistant professors or all associate professors, they're all the same rank in the university, but they have very different salaries. Um, so equity adjustments is a more complicated question, one I'm happy to, to talk more about, you're, you're there, but it is something that happens to go up through there. It's not exclusively through the salary process. Sometimes individuals throughout the year will be talking to their chair, their supervisor, their dean, making a case for that individual. It's just, it's also appropriate, even though, because it, and the thing is, selective salary, we think, oh, you can only talk about selective salary. No, it's, it's also the place to talk about that, but it's not the only place to talk about it. <coughs> Sorry, no, I'm just uh, This, maybe 
more question for Boris, but I wonder, for all these things about how these various things can be applied, is there a mechanism maybe like this um, through which the dean